Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm absolutely delighted to be here to present the research findings of my own PhD research. And I offer the sincere apologies of my colleagues, Professor Hugh McKenna, Dr. Sinead Keeney, and Dr. Derek McLaughlin, who unfortunately weren't able to be here with me today. Um, my PhD research explored young adult service users' perspectives of mental health recovery, and if we've heard already today, the phrase recovery is something that comes up time and time again when we talk about mental health. So it was very important for us within this research to find out what the experience was for young adults who are actually embarking on that journey as they move through it. So this presentation today is going to provide a very brief background to the area, the relevance to CARES, giving you a very, very brief overview of the research design. But if you forgive me, I'm going to spend the majority of this session talking about the actual research findings themselves, because it took an incredible amount of bravery for these young people to be involved in this research project. And I think it's my duty to, to really present it in their words and not my own. I would say most of us in this room are, are fully aware of recovery as a concept, but for those of that maybe would just require a wee bit of background, there are two main conceptualizations of recovery. Recovery from, which is very much the traditional medical model of the complete remission of symptoms, and then recovery in, which, as Dr. Thompson has already alluded to, is the ability to live a meaningful life despite the present of ongoing difficulties. In 2011, Limi et al. in King's College in London tried to establish a real idea of what the conceptual components were, really to unpick this term so we could really understand it, and they proposed the acronym CHIME. This stood for connectedness, hope, identity, meaning in life and empowerment. However, as research began to emerge and as service user research really began to, to, to come to the fore, it became clear that the complexities and the barriers to the real life sustainability of these components began to emerge. So the rationale very briefly behind this research study was that most mental health difficulties emerge in young adulthood and that as Coleman in 1999 states, a, a very, very eminent service user writer, he said that the onset of mental illness can lead to the dilution of an individual self-concept. And there is no age where that is going to be more profound and the impact is going to be more profound than the formative developmental years of young adulthood. Bunton et al. in 2012 presented an epidemiological estimate of the prevalence of mental health disorders and revealed that it was young adults defined as 18 to 34 that had the highest risk of disorders in all classifications. So what is the relevance to CARES? As we all know, this is a forum and a very welcome forum that the three universities can come together and present and discuss evidence-based policy. As already has been mentioned today, the Bamford Review um, very much had recovery as the ethos which underpinned all services. Yet again, in, in Transforming Your Care, a real seminal piece of work, we hear about the recovery model as a, as a model of care that assumes that people with mental health problems can be treated with appropriate tailored support. And then around 2012, when we look at the, the, the executive's evaluation of this and how we move forward, we see that recovery can mean different things to different people. And this leads us to kind of ask, what does recovery mean if everybody can take a different interpretation of it, if there is that vagueness around that issue? So our aim in this research study was to explore young adult service users, so those young adults who are really embarking on this journey, what is their perspective of mental health recovery? Our sample was the age of 18 to 35, and we recruited from the voluntary sector support in Northern Ireland. Our study was three-phased and three-phased qualitative design, um, starting off with a concept analysis of mental health recovery, just so we could really understand the key conceptual opponents of recovery, looking at how it was talked about in, in culture, in music, in art, all the different influences that a young person would be experiencing and what that word actually meant. Phase two was one of the most exciting phases of the study because it was very much a co-creation and collaboration with service users. We developed two engagement groups in Northern Ireland in two major cities where young adult service users worked with me closely to actually develop the interview schedule we would then use in phase three, which was just face-to-face semi-structured interviews with 25 service users across Northern Ireland. As part of the research design, we took the definition then that we kind of got from this, we compared it back to the conceptual components, and we then proposed our own definition of how we, we understood and how these young people understood mental health recovery to be. For this, um, uh, this phase, was I'm going to actually spend most of the time talking about today, and this is a phase three, which was a semi-structured interview phase. The method of this is obviously determined by the research question, which is exploring young adult service perspectives. So we really needed to ask the question to them directly and spend time with them exploring it. 
It was semi-structured interviews with 25 service users, and their age was 18 to 35, with usually an average of around 27. Interestingly, more males took part in the research study than females, uh, which is something we weren't overly expecting at the time. We thought that would take a wee tiny bit more coaxing, but, but they had a story and they were very, very keen to tell it. And we wanted really to explore recovery within the sphere in which people actually live their lives. The analysis process of this was quite detailed, but I have copies of the official report that we made with me today, and I'm more than happy to provide that to anybody that wants a wee bit more detail. But as I said at the beginning, I think it's important that we go to the actual testimony of these young people. Um, what you'll see now is the themes that have been presented. There's six key themes that emerged. It's going to be very much in Northern Irish vernacular and how these young people speak. The themes are, are titled with the language that the young people use to me themselves. And very unusually, maybe for a presentation of this nature, I'm going to ask something of each and every one of you before I begin this. I'm going to ask you just to take one minute before I begin. And I want you to remember how you felt at the age of 18, 19. What music you listened to, maybe what clothes you liked to wear, what perfume you used to wear, who you were in love with, who you had, you had your heart broken by. And I want you to remember what it felt like to be at that age and be at that, at that stage in your life. Because these quotes just become useless words if we don't actually walk through them. There's no point in us looking in from the outside. We need to experience this with them. Because we really should understand evidence and evidence base. It's not only clinical experience and research experience, but experiential voices that can come in and really illuminate this issue. So the first phases of recovery. This was usually preceded by weeks, months, even years of extreme emotional distress contained within the pretense of who these young people felt they should be. This led to an eventual internal implosion where they just fell down within themselves and they were taken, as they describe it, right down to their foundations. Within the context of this internal implosion, participants described reaching a moment of complete and utter crisis where the initial steps of recovery had to be walked in very unknown personal territory, as they described it, as a step in the dark. It's hard, like, but you kind of have to take a step. A step in the dark, but you have to try, you have to take that first step, because if you don't, you're just going to regress and go back, or like you're never going to recover at all. You're not letting yourself do anything, you're not letting, you're not giving yourself a chance to recover. It'll be unsurprising to many of the colleagues in this room that the next theme, which was very pertinent in these uh, findings, was that services were described by young people as a losing battle straight away. Access and engagement to healthcare services were identified as a direct barrier to mental health recovery in two key ways. The communication of distress, how that distress was communicated by young people, how it was understood when it was communicated, and crucially, what access to services this enabled them to have or made them eligible to. Those few that gained access to healthcare services were left on waiting lists for months and even longer. They were maybe provided with an 0800 number in the hours of 9 to 5, but not the crisis moments of nighttime or weekends. And then they were met with service providers that were delivering to them what they understood to be and described to me as a recovery orientation. It was far removed from their own experience of the journey that they had gone through. Unable to meet the expectations of this recovery orientation, these young people began to perceive recovery as another assessment that they had failed. It was something in their lives that they could not do. They are trained, they're almost programmed to think a certain way. Do you know what I mean? You can only say to them on so much and they think they know best. So like, do you know what I mean? It's, it's to have a losing battle straight away. The experience of mental health recovery for these young adults involved channeling pain into personal power. Participants described that when right down to their foundations, they were faced with a critical decision. Were they to live from the pain or were they to die from the pain? This process was underpinned by discovering a real determination, an internal determination that fueled their survival forward, and that was a reason to recover. This reason to recover was not about other people, and it was not what was expected of them, but it had to come from within themselves. Through analysis, it became very clear to myself and the team that they longed for emancipation from their circumstances. They longed to be free of where they were at. As one participant put it to me, their back had been up against the wall long enough. For them, mental health recovery was surviving out of the ashes. Like a phoenix out of the ashes, out of a fire, the fire is your trauma, pain, everything, and then it dies down and you have the ashes, which is just like the last bit of it, and then you're like a phoenix coming out of it. You're surviving out of the ashes. 
Participants began to realise that pain and life could not be avoided, but it did not have to be relived. They could use what they now knew about themselves and their lives to move forward, and they could use this to fuel a real positive sense of achievement within themselves. The importance of learning from their own experiences required the transformation of this fiery, brutal, all-consuming emotional pain into an internal kinetic energy that progressed the recovery journey forward. But this process involved two sub-themes, focus and time. Firstly, focus. Their perception of themselves, their experiences and their lives had to fundamentally change. There was no light bulb moment when the lights were finally switched on, but the narrow light with which they viewed themselves and their life got wider and wider until they held a different perspective. But this process took time. It was slow, it was arduous, it was painful. They needed to give themselves time and others needed to give them time in order to do that. They needed the time to realise that they no longer could live out of their past or, as Katie Erickson would say, futurise their difficulties and feel that they were never going to get out of where they were at. It was about assuming and taking on their life right there and then as they found it. And life had to be lived day by day as they took these steps out of the darkness. For these participants, they described the confusion surrounding the word recovery. When used at an inappropriate stage, it implied that they felt they needed to be fixed, like they were a broken hard drive or a broken vehicle. For them, it did not express their own experience. The ambiguity of the term recovery required from them that they had to apply personal influences in their lives that give it real meaning and actually contextualise it within their own life, making it a relevant strategy that they could use to take control over their life. And just to give you a very brief example of that, that would have been photography, sci-fi, music, Harry Potter, whatever it was that gave their life real meaning at that time, they applied that to the recovery journey and used that as a metaphor for how they got themselves out of it. So this became almost a developmental process as by applying the things that brought meaning and life to their recovery and journey, meaning and life and meaning and recovery became inextricably linked. Real life application made it a strategy that they could own and they could maintain. Others were the how. Participants described experiencing devastating losses at the time of the onset of illness. The loss of friendships, relationships, social group, social skills, missed milestones and broken dreams. Increased connection to others through peer support provided valuable learning to repair those broken skill sets that they had lost. But crucially, they began to see that their experience and what they had lived through and what they had survived, when shared, had real value and could create a connection with others through knowing that the experience of emotional pain. Within this context, recovery was understood as an increased connection to others through a deeper connection to self. There have been so many times when I just thought, I'm just ending it all, I want to die, I am not living, and I've done things to try and make that happen, but it has been those people who have kept me alive, and so if it wasn't for those people, I wouldn't be in recovery, because it has been those people who got me through until I've been ready to actually fight for my recovery and then maintain it. So what are the key conclusions then? We have identified the factors that really feature in a young adult's perception of recovery and how these can be positively targeted and facilitated. And it's unsurprising and it's come up as a key theme already in, in some of the talks that healthcare services, real life application and connection to others are key to that. The explanatory model that young people use to describe mental health recovery and understand it within their own lives is best described by one of my participants as use the stuff that you want to bury. They began to realise that they had to let go of the pain but not the experience because it took time to refocus and realise that you have been formed out of these pains. The word recovery was not reflective of the conceptual components but also not the lived experience. And when you asked them what was better for them, they said just simply building a better life. There are key four groups that we feel the recommendations should be made, four key priority groups from this study. Firstly, our policymakers. This research proposes that there must be a definition of mental health recovery personalised for young people in Northern Ireland that must now take a massive role within mental health policy and future mental health policy to ensure that the provision of services are not only, not only informed by our young people but are tailored to their needs. The omission of any regional interpretation of recovery has propagated a very generic and vague understanding of what it means and one that is in danger of being very disconnected from the social and cultural context, context that our young people actually live in and therefore lack in relevance for them. 
Our policymakers need to understand the considerable risk to young adults of mental health recovery not being properly understood and understood in a way that these young people can apply to their own lives. Because this is a direct impact on how they view their life perspective and their chances of actually recovering from the situation that they find themselves in. It must be made explicitly clear that it is now time to talk about age-appropriate strategies and that inform services, but also that young adults are very involved in that discussion. Our service providers are the next priority group, and there's an urgent need to recognise, prioritise and attend to the pain and suffering that our young adults are presenting with, specifically before they reach the point of emotional crisis. Our findings do suggest, and I think again it has come up on our colleagues here who have talked, that young people are seeking help for their distress, but what they are met with is significant communication difficulties. While the financial constraints on departmental budgets might account for diminishing resources, and we all fully appreciate that in this room, it doesn't account for young adults being asked questions that they have described to me as debilitating, as making them feel so small, or as the worst thing that they've ever encountered in their life been summed up on a small piece of paper. Educators and information providers like ourselves across the three universities, we need to be very, very cognizant when we are educating our young healthcare professions and the adult allied health professions to make it explicitly clear to them that inadequate or an insensitive healthcare communication is a significant barrier to mental health recovery. While recovery in mental health is very much anchored in our mental health discourse in Northern Ireland, the use of terminology or of language to young people that doesn't take into account its personal, social or cultural significance or relevance can lead to the propagation of a very ambiguous message that is confusing for them. The implications of this is that all practices and approaches could be rebranded under the banner of recovery without the cultural change really needed for a new approach. We would also promote very much that all the allied health professions have a very person-centred approach to the curriculum in which mental health recovery is tied in to that. And for young adults in the general population, mental health recovery information and, should, should, and support should be widely available to the general population, not just young people when, when they get into crisis. This should be communicated through meaningful and relevant mental health promotion strategies. The development of a considered and a contemporary anti-stigma campaign which promotes mental health recovering is now vital. Public health agencies, the arts community and youth-focused organisations should collaborate with service user organisations to design a culturally relevant Northern Irish anti-stigma campaign targeted at young adults in the general population to ensure that mental health recovering becomes embedded in youth culture as a wellness strategy for building a better life. To conclude, as this focus of our seminar today is the promotion of evidence-based policy, I would like to leave you just in the, in the, with a quote from one of the participants. You could probably say it maybe more succinctly than I can. There is no good just saying something without the action being followed through behind it. Saying we're going to help you recover and then not having the infrastructure in place to help you do that, because that is just false promises. For those of us who live, work, research, advocate and legislate mental health, Findings from this study suggest a fundamental question and now unavoidable question needs to be asked. What happens to a young adult who is down to their foundations, struggling to take a step into the dark, experiencing a losing battle straight away when they try and access services, desperately trying to find a reason to survive out of their ashes, when all they receive are false promises? Thank you very much.